name is Joseph West. I'm one of the campus ministers at St. Augustine Catholic Church and Student Center. And today is Tuesday. Now, ordinarily, if you were to walk into the St. Augustine Lounge on any given Tuesday at around 6.30 p.m., you would find close to 200 college students gathered together to share a communal meal uh, in table fellowship. Uh, now, unfortunately, if you were to walk in tonight, you would find our lounge and dining hall empty because of the... Uh, ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Now, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. And so during this time when we can't gather together in our usually scheduled uh, meal, we're going to be gathering spiritually. I want us to take this time uh, to reflect on what it truly means to share a meal with someone. So over the next couple weeks, the staff at St. Augustine Catholic Student Center uh, is going to be offering reflections every Tuesday in lieu of our regularly scheduled Newman dinners. Um, and we'll be reflecting on what it means to be a Catholic human. We'll be looking at table fellowship in Scripture, all through the lens of God's favorite love language, food. Now I say that God's favorite love language is food because salvation history itself, which is the beautiful story that Scripture presents to us, the story of God's loving pursuit of man is bookended and filled with meals, right? So uh, scripture itself begins in the book of Genesis with a wedding feast for Adam and Eve. God creates man and woman in relationship as a married couple, and he offers this bountiful garden of Eden to them as a wedding present and as a wedding feast, offering them all the fruits of the garden. And then scripture ends with the book of Revelation. Right, and the second half of the book of Revelation focuses on the wedding feast of the Lamb, right? The Lamb's Supper, where all Christians are united in Christ, where we come together in the New Jerusalem and celebrate a sacred meal together. So, going back to Genesis, uh, the story of Adam and Eve God places Adam and Eve in a garden and he tasks them with cultivating the garden and protecting it, right? So, they're supposed to work in the garden. Right, labor and toil it and bring the glorious fruit of creation forward in this feast. Uh, God gives them, as a part of this, again, wedding present, all the food they could desire to eat, but he forbids them from eating from one tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happens? Of course, they eat from this tree. But what does this moment mean, and what does it have to do with table fellowship and uh, fellowship in Scripture? Well, uh, Adam and Eve fall under temptation of the serpent, they eat from the tree that God warned them not to eat from, or else they would die. And scripture tells us that Eve specifically eats the fruit for three reasons. That the fruit itself was a delight to the eyes, it looked tasty, and it was desirable for making her like God. So she has this lust of the flesh, right? This delight to the senses, this beauty to the eye, right? This sort of curiosity. And then finally, uh, it's desirable for making one like God. Now remember, Adam and Eve had been created in the image and likeness of God, so she's grasping for something that's already hers, that's freely offered to her. And so what essentially happens here is that Adam and Eve are taking the created thing while rejecting the Creator. In terms of the grand feast of creation, they want dinner, but they don't want the chef. They want to eat, but they don't want to share a meal. So the original sin is, in some sense, Adam and Eve kicking God out of their shared meal. Now, Scripture mentions something else here. There's another tree in the garden. Not only the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but there's also the tree of life, which offers immortality. God banishes Adam and Eve from the garden, not only as a punishment, but also Scripture makes the point to say that it's to protect them from the tree of life. Why? Because God recognizes now that they are sinful and unhappy. And God does not want them to reach out their hands, take the fruit from the tree of life, and now be sinful, unhappy, and immortal. And so God banishes them from the garden. So the result of sin, the effect of their sin, is that they are no longer able to enter into table fellowship with God. They cannot share a meal with God and eat of the tree of life. The best fruit of the garden becomes inaccessible to them. Well, God then places an uh, angel in the garden to protect the path, both to stop men who might go and try and return to the garden and take the tree of life for themselves, but also to guard its way so that one day 
man might return to the garden and eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Uh, the rest of salvation history right, revolves around this story right, of God preparing his chosen people to one day enter into this feast, this communal meal with him, to receive once again the tree of life. In fact, the book of Revelation at the very, very end, the last chapter of the last book in scripture, the Revelation of St. John chapter 22 reads, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So scripture ends in the book of Revelation with the tree of life becoming accessible once again to man and bearing its fruit in this shared feast. Well, in the story of salvation, God continues to prepare his chosen people for this future meal, for this wedding feast of the Lamb, when God and man would be united once again. Uh, and he does this through prophecies, but he also does this through the formation of covenants in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 25, it reads, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of fat things, a feast of fine wine. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. So the prophets foretold of this coming feast that would undo Adam and Eve, and uh, undo the sin of Adam and Eve, right, when the tree of life would become accessible once again. What mountain uh, is Isaiah talking about here in Isaiah chapter 25? Well, he identifies it in the chapter before as Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where Jesus will later offer the last supper. So to prepare his people for this future banquet, for the Last Supper, for the Tree of Life, God forms covenants in the Old Testament. Now covenants form family bonds. So a covenant, unlike a contract, if you've ever heard Scott Hahn talk about this, he always says that a contract is an exchange of goods, while a covenant is an exchange of persons, like marriage. Right? Two people come together and form a union to where they are now one. Well, uh, God forms covenants with his people in scripture, and often these covenants are ratified with sacrificial meals. So in the Old Testament, uh, we sometimes have this mindset where God demands sacrifice, and he just wants to see blood and gore. But that's actually not the case. There are multiple types of sacrifices in Judaism. One of them is a burnt offering, uh, and that's probably one of the more prevalent ones in the Old Testament. And that is where the sacrificial victim, the animal, would be slaughtered and burnt as an offering, uh, and all of it would be given to God. The entire offering would be burnt. But there are countless instances, and especially at the formation of covenants, we see a peace offering taking place, where the animal would be slaughtered and burnt, but both parties would partake. So both God, uh, the fire would consume some of the sacrifice, but it was very, very important that the other member, right, the priest and the people forming this peace offering, would eat of the sacrifice as well. So sacrifices in the Old Testament are actually communal meals with God that form family bonds. Uh, this is actually why in uh, Luke chapter 15, the Pharisees are so upset with Jesus and frustrated because they're the ones who've been holding to the law, and if Jesus is the Messiah, why is he eating with all these sinners? And it says specifically in verse 2, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So the Pharisees aren't just upset that Jesus is spending time with sinners, but that he's sharing meals with them, that he's identifying himself as family with these sinful people. So meals form family bonds. One of the major sacrificial meals in the Old Testament is the Passover. In fact, we could probably identify this as the main sacrificial meal in the Old Testament. Uh, when the Israelite people are enslaved in Egypt, God frees them through several plagues. The final and worst plague is the death of the firstborn son. So all the firstborn sons in Egypt will die. And the Israelite people are specifically spared from this awful plague through the offering of an unblemished lamb, roasting it and partaking of its flesh. So they create this covenantal meal with God. And in eating this meal, and it's very, very important that they consume the lamb. If you did not actually partake of the lamb and join in this meal, then you would wake up the next morning, even as an Israelite, and your firstborn son 
would be dead. And so it's in partaking of this meal that the familial bond is created and the nation of Israel is identified as God's firstborn son who will be spared from the plague. Now, after they're liberated, they approach Mount Sinai and they form a covenant. So they form this family bond at the base of Mount Sinai uh, through a sacrifice. And how this sacrifice occurs is Moses, they offer uh, sacrificial bulls, and Moses takes the blood of the bulls and he offers the blood up and says, this is the blood of the covenant. And he pours the blood on the altar and he pours the blood on the people. And it symbolizes that they now share blood with God. Right? They have created this family bond. And then Moses takes, and this is in Exodus chapter 24, Moses and the priests and elders take some of the bull that they've offered, the roasted flesh, and they take those up the mountain where they see God and they have a banquet with God. And so the ratification of this covenant is in a family meal that they bring what they have prepared, the sacrifice that they've offered to God, and they partake of it as well. They eat it. And it's at this moment that God details how they will construct what's called a tabernacle. And so after they've had this family meal with God, God shows them how to build a tabernacle, which is going to be a mobile temple, a mobile Mount Sinai, where God will dwell among them. So it's after partaking of this meal that they are able to have God dwelling among them as a people. The meal itself forms this family bond. The, the covenant is ratified through this sacrificial offering and meal. Uh, well, unfortunately, um, the Israelite people at the base of the mountain are offering a sacrifice to a false god. Moses has been gone for many days at this point on the mountain as God is detailing, uh, giving the Ten Commandments, uh, and, and teaching them how to obey his laws. Well, the people at the base of the mountain build a false god, right, a golden calf. And what's interesting, this golden calf symbolizes, right, gold for wealth. The, the god itself is the bull god Apis, who is the god in Egypt of sex, of power, and of money, right? The same three things, in a sense, that tempted Eve, right? A lust uh, for a, a desire of something tasty, right? A delight to the eyes and a desire to be like God, power, wealth, and sex. And so they fall in the same way. And what it specifically says is that they make a peace offering with this God. They have a communal meal with this false, fake God. And so how they break the covenant is by having a meal with a false God. So they break the covenant uh, and they are no longer now uh, in right relationship with God. Why? Because they violated this sacrificial meal. Now, it's interesting about the tabernacle itself that they then later construct and, and still have God dwelling among them, is the tabernacle is adorned with garden imagery, and it's supposed to symbolize the people's return in right relationship with God to the Garden of Eden and the future reception of the Tree of Life. This brings us now to the Last Supper. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, Jesus, celebrating the Passover, offers bread to his disciples, saying, this is my body, identifying the bread as the flesh of the Passover lamb that they are to receive and consume. Then he offers a cup of wine and says, this is the blood of the new covenant, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus is now both imitating Moses on Mount Sinai, raising blood and saying, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is a reference to Jeremiah. He's referencing the new covenant that the prophets foretold of, the, the new feast, the sacrificial meal. But not only is he quoting Moses, he's also uh, identifying back to Isaiah 25, because jo uh, Jesus is not on Mount Sinai, he's on Mount Zion, which is where Isaiah had foretold, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of fat things, a feast of fine wine. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. So Jesus is inaugurating a new covenantal meal, a way for us to have table fellowship with God. Jesus then, after this, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of Olives, to prepare for his death. Now, some Jewish writers in Jesus' day, there's a, a Jewish writing uh, from the first century called The Life of Adam and Eve, and in this document, it identifies this Jewish tradition that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a fig tree and the tree of life was an olive tree. 
And so there's a Jewish tradition circulating at Jesus' time that the tree of life was an olive tree, and Jesus chooses to go into the Garden of Olives. Why? Because that is where he, the new tree of life, will plant himself in prayer and prepare to be offered on the cross. The next day, he is nailed to a tree and hangs off that tree as its fruit. The fruit of the tree of life is the body of our Lord in the Eucharist, a fruit that we are offered to partake of, that we are told to partake of, so that we might have life within us. The tree of life in the Garden of Eden, right? this future sacrificial meal that God is preparing his covenant people for, is fulfilled in Jesus' cross. And by partaking of this meal, we no longer, or we're sorry, we not only become family with God, but we also receive immortality. We receive eternal life. All of this has been to say that there is something truly sacred about meals. Meals are sacrificial and life-giving. They bring us together and unite us. When we dine together, we are offering the fruit of our labor for our family, for our friends. Right? We're laying down some part of our life. Or if someone else has prepared dinner for us, we should be grateful for the gift they've given us, for the sacrifice that they've laid down, for the fruits of their labor. Uh, as Henry Nouwen once said, when we invite friends for a meal, we do much more than offer them food for their bodies. We offer friendship, fellowship, good conversation, intimacy, and closeness. When we say, help yourself, take some more, don't be shy, have another glass, we offer guests not only our food and drink, but our very selves. A spiritual bond grows when we become food and drink for one another. Now during these uncertain times, I ask that you reflect deeply on the sacrificial and communicative aspects of meals. Invite God to your dinner table. Ask those around you that you're eating with about their day and take time to slow down and enjoy the bounty set before you. And I ask especially uh, that you recall those words that all of us have memorized that we pray so often and yet uh, oftentimes fail to truly reflect on. Bless us, O Lord, and bless these your gifts which we are about to receive from your bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen.